My name is Nada Awad. I am the International Advocacy Officer at the Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies. I will be moderating this discussion. Please use the Q&A section uh, to ask written questions to the speakers. And for those following us on Facebook, please send us your questions and comments on the live stream. Today's webinar will focus on Israel's use of collective punishment as a tool to dominate the Palestinian people, which is the focus of the special rapporteur, Mr. Michael Link's upcoming report to the Human Rights Council, which will be discussed on Thursday under item seven. Our organizations would like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Link for covering this important topic in his report. Collective punishment is illegal under international humanitarian law. Article 33 of the Fourth Geneva Convention clearly states that no protected person may be punished for an offense he or she has not personally committed. Reprisals against protected persons and their property are prohibited. Professor Shane Darcy, who has studied the illegality of collective punishment, wrote in 2010, I quote, invading armies and occupying powers have used collective punishments in the hope of curbing attacks and ensuring obedience, although the stated aim of deference has at times served as a mere cloak for oppression and subjugation. This approach is reflected in Israel's policy, which targets the Palestinian people. For example, the previous Israel Ministry of Interior Minister, Ariel Derry, declared in January 2017, I quote, from now on, anyone who plots, plans, or considers carrying out an attack will know that his family will, face, will pay a heavy price for his deed. He warned that, I quote, consequences will be harsh and far-reaching. While Israel uses the security pretext and rhetoric to justify its inhumane policies, the UN Rights Committee has clearly stated that the prohibition against collective punishment is non-derogable even in states of emergency. Yet Israel consistently uses the security rationale to escalate its punitive policies against the Palestinian people with the aim to punish, oppress, subjugate, and forcibly transfer Palestinians. Israel's collective punishment policies include home demolitions, economic and psychological warfare against the families of alleged attackers, including the withholding of bodies of deceased Palestinians. They also include closure of entire neighborhoods and reprisals in al to alleged attacks. Israel has used collective punishment against Palestinians since 48. Israeli occupying forces have demolished or sealed off over 2,000 homes across the OPT uh, since 1967. Between January and June 2020, Israel demolished four Palestinian homes on punitive grounds, resulting in the displacement of 19 people, including three children, two of which were carried out following the outbreak, uh, outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. I now would like to turn to Budur Hassan, legal researcher at the Jerusalem Legal Aid and Human Rights Center. She will present Israel's withholding of bodies of deceased Palestinians as a case study of collective punishment. Budur, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nada. The 12th of March, 2019 was supposed to be just another normal day for the Yasser Shwiki family as normal as life can be, obviously, under military occupation, settler colonialism and apartheid. Yasser lives in Hebron, Khalil. He is the sole breadwinner for his family. He's 36 years old and has six children. But he left his home and he never returned because while he was doing his duty, uh, delivering documents in the court, he was extrajudicially executed by Israeli occupation authorities. Little did his children know back then that this would be the last time they'd see his, their father, they'd quarrel over who would fetch his uh, shirt or who would get to talk to him and who would ask him for presents and gifts and chocolate to bring him back home. But as if the trauma of their father being killed, extrajudicially executed was, was not enough, as if the pain of having to see the news of their father's killing on Facebook was not enough. Israel continues to withhold the body of Yasser since 2019, preventing his family from paying him farewell, preventing him, the, his family from uh, mourning him with peace and dignity. But Yasser Shweki is not alone. He's one of 64 Palestinians who since 2016 continue to be with, whose bodies continue to be withheld by Israel in violation of international law. 
and international humanitarian law. The pretext of the withholding of these bodies are to be used uh, as bargaining chips in potential negotiations over prisoner swap deals, or because Israel claims that the attacks they carried are exceptionally severe without even providing evidence that these people were extrajudicially executed because they were carrying out attacks. Israel uses the British Emergency Regulation Number 133, which was enacted by British authorities in 1945, in order to legitimize its use of withholding of Palestinian bodies as bargaining chips, also citing a decision by the Israeli cabinet dating back to 2017, in order to put uh, these condi conditions on withholding the bodies. Initially, the Israeli Supreme Court outlawed this policy, deciding that the uh, emergency regulation was not a sufficient source of authority, but eventually the Israeli court changed its mind and in a precedent reverted the, the decision in 2019, decided that the uh, regulation should be broadly interpreted to allow the Israeli occupying powers to continue withholding bodies in order to use them as uh, bargaining chips. The vast majority of the bodies being withheld by Israel are bodies of Palestinian civilians, including five people who were killed while they were imprisoned, while they were serving long sentences, meaning that Israeli punishment of Palestinians expands even beyond their lifetime. In addition to those who are being withheld as bargaining chips, Israel also has enacted a law a counterterrorism law that dates back to uh, March 2018 that allows it to delay the return of Palestinian martyrs' bodies to their families, citing security, security and deterrence, and even imposing conditions on the funerals of those Palestinians, limiting the numbers of Palestinians who can attend the funeral, even preventing Palestinians from carrying out certain items in these funerals, and uh, forcing Palestinians to bury their loved ones in certain cemeteries or carry out the funeral at certain times in violation of their right to family life, their right to dignity, their right to their religious and cultural customs, and also constituting, as the Committee Against Torture uh, concluded in 2016, ill-treatment and torture in the form of withholding these bodies. In addition to those two pretexts, Israel has, has also been withholding for decades the bodies of hundreds of Palestinians, at least 253 Palestinians, whose bodies are languishing in what Israel refers to as cemeteries for enemy combatants. These are uh, unidentified cemeteries that are declared as military zones which Palestinians cannot uh, access, where the, the bodies of Palestinians are mostly I I unidentified and are langu languishing in these cemeteries and these places of burial without, and for decades, so many Palestinians have been just waiting for Israel to release the names and uh, the details of these people. Uh, the conditions in these cemeteries are demeaning and violate fundamental rights, both of the dead to dignified burial and of their families to bury them with dignity and peace. Uh, these forms of uh, burial and these forms of withholding of bodies constitute a grave breach of international humanitarian law as explained by the rules on handling the bodies of the dead, the customary international humanitarian law rules, particularly which encourages the rule that encourages the uh, occupying power to facilitate the return of but the bodies of those who are continue to be withheld by Israeli occupation forces. As such, we encourage and we uh, call on third states to put pressure on Israel to return all bodies being withheld, particularly the 64 bodies being withheld since 2016, and also to put pressure on Israel to identify, locate, and exhume the bodies it continues to withhold and bury in uh, cemeteries of numbers, in cemeteries for enemy combatants, and to end unconditionally its policy of withholding the bodies of Palestinian martyrs, because it not only does it constitute these viol the aforementioned violations of international law. It also constitutes collective punishment, not only against the family, but against the entirety of the Palestinian community. While Israel always claims that this is a form of deterrence and that this is a form th this is necessitated by security, the true purpose of the withholding of bodies is to control, subordinate, and continue the colonization 
of the Palestinian body, the Palestinian life, whether, whether a living or dead, Palestinians are viewed as a security threat that should be contained, that should be neutralized. And this form of withholding bodies, we view it as a form of post-mortem punishment and a form of necropolitics and necroviolence that should be immediately and unconditionally stopped. Thank you so much, Boudoir, for this presentation on the topic of withholding of bodies of deceased Palestinians. Uh, I now turn to advocate Sahar Francis, General Director of Al-Damir Support and Human Rights Association. She will address Israeli policies of collective punishment against Palestinian prisoners. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for the Cairo Institute for organizing thing, uh, this and for all the colleagues especially for uh, Mr. Michael Lenk for his report about the collective punishment. Actually, the issue of Palestinian prisoners reflects uh, uh, lots of aspects of how uh, the Israeli occupation is using collective punishment in order to keep the control over the whole Palestinian society like imprisonment itself is, is sometimes used as a collective punishment when they launch mass arrest campaigns and they raid Palestinian cities and, and uh, arrest hundreds of people in one night and uh, bring them for detention centers. Uh, um, the, uh, like maybe the largest campaign of mass arrest campaign took place in the re, like the reinvasion of the Palestinian cities in 2002 when Israeli occupation forces uh, uh, like entered the whole Palestinian cities and arrested thousands of people more than 15,000 men in in less than one month and they were uh, like arresting people that they were not involved at all in any activity in the second intifada at that time. Uh, it's repeating itself like lately in the last couple of months, uh, the village Yabad, the town Yabad was facing the same uh, night raids. Uh, like usually it happens when there's an accident or a militant attack that takes place in one certain village then the whole village would be under curfew, night searches and, and uh, uh, arrests on a daily basis against people from the, the same village, even if they are not uh, at all related to the event itself. And the process, like, and, and there's lots of villages that we can talk about, especially those that they have the weekly demonstrations against the, uh, the establishment of the wall, for example, that they, uh, like Bil'in, Alin, and Nabi Saleh, uh, uh, and all the other uh, villages that anyone that joined the uh, demonstra Friday demonstrations, he, he could be arrested. So actually the army raids the, uh, uh, the village after or sometimes in the time of the demonstration and they arrest any person that they uh, 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 find without really being connected to the acts happening in the demonstration itself. Uh, when you're arrested and when they raid your house, the collective punishment could be also against your family because usually they do searches uh, in the house, they miss the house, they mistreat the whole family member when they lock, the, lock them down in one room in a very bad circumstances, especially in winter or in hot summer. And they do arrest sometimes if they don't find you the wanted person in practice, is they, they can arrest one of the family member in order for to enforce you to surround yourself. Later, when you're brought to the interrogation centers uh, uh, and you are under uh, pressure, torture, physical and psychological uh, pressure, one of the methods, the psychological methods that are used against these uh, prisoners under interrogation would be arresting one family member, especially your mother or your wife or your sister in order to put pressure against the detainee 
Uh, and in several cases that the Domir documented in the summer of 2019, mothers of uh, in people who were interrogated in the Russian compound were arrested in order to be uh, to put pressure on their uh, uh, like beloved ones under the interrogation in order to confess and. Uh, uh, um, like to, to put them more in this psychological uh, uh, difficult circumstances. Also, when you're uh, uh, in the prison, like when you're either awaiting the trial or you're uh, uh, already uh, sentenced and you're sitting uh, uh, on your sentence in the, in the prison, you can face as a prisoner lots of uh, violations that could be considered as a collective punishment against the whole prisoners uh, movement like ban on family visits and this is the most common uh, uh, used tool to punish the whole prisoners uh, um, community by banning their family members sometimes it's against the whole family sometimes it's against family like individuals in the families and sometimes it's a total ban on a, a, a family visit from certain area, like it happened, for example, for the prisoners from the Gaza uh, Strip since 2007 up till 2012. For more than five years, the whole Palestinian prisoners from the Gaza Strip were punished by totally canceling their family visits and uh, uh, they were totally disconnected from their family. And in this case specifically when the Israeli and Palestinian human rights organizations petitioned the Israeli High Court twice actually in this period on the family uh, visits ban claiming that this is a collective punishment and this is violating international law. The Israeli High Court unfortunately claimed that the family uh, uh, visit by itself is not a humanitarian aspect of the Port Geneva Convention so it's not not binding Israel, uh, 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 binding Israel to implement the family visits for the Palestinian prisoners, and they dismissed the case and actually confirmed the uh, total cancellation of the family visits. Uh, prisoners uh, sections, the, the, se the security sections where Palestinian prisoners are held inside the Israeli prisons could be attacked and uh, uh, subject for raids by the special units like it happened just yesterday in Aufer prison, the prison near Ramallah, the special units raided one of the sections and usually they attack all of the prisoners in the section on the name of security searches or claiming that one of the prisoners committed one violation so instead of like facing the one prisoner and asking what he did or punishing him they would rather punish the whole section and it's usually accompanied with lots of violence by the special units to where the prisoners last year in 2019 more than uh, three four raids ended up with uh, like uh, some detainees severely injured in these attacks without knowing even what was their fault and why their sections were attacked in such brutal uh, way. Other form of collective punishments that the uh, prisoners can face, uh, uh, for example, when they would have a hunger strike um, activity and, uh, and uh, such mass hunger strikes usually ends with more punishments against the whole uh, uh, prisoners movement like banning the uh, uh, education, uh, continuing their education in the Israeli Open uh, uh, University. It was totally banned in 2012 after the hunger, actually a, a bit before the hunger strike of 2012. And then when they negotiated with uh, 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 like with the hunger strike agreement, the prison authority refused to agree to allow the uh, education and it was later cancelled totally by the high court. I would conclude that uh, uh, the imprisonment could be 
used as well as a tool for oppression and control and the details under the imprisonment experience could be considered as a collective punishment and uh, I wouldn't repeat what Boudour was concluding about a, a collective punishment as a war crime and crime against humanity in some circumstances that should be totally uh, uh, abolished and we ask the really uh, the inter international community to find Israel accountable for these crimes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Advocate Sahel Francis. I now turn to Dr. Munir Nsebel, General Director of the Community Action Center uh, at Al-Quds University. He will address the impact of collective punishment on Palestinians living under occupation and illegal, illegal annexation of East Jerusalem since 1967. Dr. Munir, I can't hear you. Ah, sorry, sorry, didn't you unmute myself. Now I am. Uh, thank you, Nada, and many thanks to everyone who's uh, uh, joining us today. Uh, my presentation today will focus on um, how Israel has uh, been using the uh, security justifications in order to uh, displace more and more Palestinians. And uh, uh, as part of uh, uh, the theme on collective punishment, uh, I'm going to present a few examples um, on how Israel has been uh, uh, implementing uh, this policy, collective punishment, on Palestinians, mainly uh, for the purpose of displacing more and more Palestinians in Jerusalem. Um, it's important to uh, mention first that um, um, Israel has been displacing Palestinians based on security considerations since its very establishment uh, in 1948. Uh, during the wars of 19, uh, the war of 1948, 80% uh, of the Palestinian population were displaced. In 1967, uh, um, uh, around 30% of the population of the West Bank and Gaza was displaced. And uh, in many cases, uh, in, in, in these cases and, and, and many others, um, uh, security justifications were always used by the Israeli government to justify uh, uh, these unjustifiable uh, uh, displacements of civilians. Um, but today I'm going to focus on contemporary um, uh, ways of displacing Palestinians through uh, collective punishment. Uh, this picture, the first picture I'm sharing with you, is uh, um, of a lady called Sara Dwayat. Uh, her son uh, was uh, accused uh, and uh, uh, later convicted uh, with uh, uh, throwing a stone at a moving vehicle that led to the death of the uh, driver. Uh, immediately uh, after uh, um, uh, ac arresting him and uh, accusing him, uh, the uh, Israeli authorities uh, decided to seal her house uh, as you can see in this picture, there is an iron bar uh, that prevents the lady from entering her house. She has been displaced from her house uh, together with her daughter uh, uh, since 2015. She hasn't been able to come back uh, to this house, despite the fact that she has nothing to do with uh, uh, the alleged incident uh, of uh, throwing a stone at a moving vehicle. Uh, the second picture I'm sharing with you is of another lady uh, who, uh, whose husband was also accused of an attack uh, and later on she uh, was a victim of uh, a home demolition. Uh, her house was demolished uh, and she and her children had to uh, leave that house and, and, and live outside it. Also, uh, her uh, children were prevented from uh, the right of being members in the uh, Social Welfare and Medical Insurance Institute, despite the fact that they have chronic uh, diseases. Uh, and also, obviously, again, uh, neither the lady nor her children have anything uh, to do with the uh, alleged attack that uh, they punished her for. And as we can see in both cases, uh, the result was displacing them from their homes. This third picture that I'm sharing with you uh, is of another family 
that uh, the Israeli army uh, or authorities did not demolish the house, but they pumped um, uh, concrete into the house. What you can see here in the picture uh, uh, is uh, the ceiling and just <laughs> maybe half a meter below the ceiling, there is the top of the um, uh, concrete that has been pumped into the house. Uh, and uh, what you can see from these three pictures is that um, uh, these three families uh, have uh, been displaced from their homes for nothing that they are not uh, um, uh, related to or they never did. Uh, as you can see, th this, this picture is of a couple. This lady is called Manwa Qumbar. The Israeli uh, authorities decided to revoke her residency status that allows her to live in Jerusalem. Uh, since 1967, the uh, occupation, uh, Israeli occupation authorities have uh, uh, confined the Palestinian population in Jerusalem with uh, a status known as residency status that is uh, uh, much less than the uh, uh, citizenship uh, and it is easily revocable. So after they accused her uh, uh, son who was killed in, in, in the incidents, uh, um, in, in that incident, uh, in, in an attack, in an alleged attack. Uh, they revoked her residency status uh, immediately, which means that she is unable to live in Jerusalem. Um, another um, uh, problem which our uh, center, which provides legal aid, is dealing with, uh, as well as other centers, there are persons who um, have invited their spouses uh, to live with them in Jerusalem through a family unification application and they uh, had this uh, temporary permit according to the discriminatory Israeli law on family unification, a temporary permit to live in Jerusalem that they needed to renew uh, constantly. After a certain incident, uh, uh, the Israeli authorities um, decided to uh, stop family unification applications for uh, relatives of the Qumbar family in this case um, and in that way they prevented these families from their right to live under uh, the same roof uh, in Jerusalem and eventually uh, um, this decision uh, is a decision to displace uh, family members who uh, uh, live in Jerusalem as part of a family unification application. Um, this last uh, uh, example of collective punishment is of women who uh, are known as murabitat. They are uh, women who uh, demonstrate peacefully at Al-Aqsa Mosque against uh, uh, settler uh, invasions of the mosque. Uh, they are afraid that uh, these invasions are uh, targeting changing the status quo of the mosque uh, to become a synagogue. So they demonstrate peacefully. Um, the Israeli authorities has created a blacklist of them, but in addition to that, uh, preventing them from their right to enter the mosque, but in addition to that, they also removed uh, a number of them as well as uh, their family members from uh, their subscription in the uh, Social Welfare Institute, which also includes uh, uh, medical insurance. Um, um, so in that way, they punished their whole families for that action. Uh, finally, what I would here say is um, that there are bills currently being discussed in the Israeli parliament, uh, according to which, uh, if they are approved, uh, the, the residences of Palestinians uh, and family members of people that Israel will call terrorists uh, might be um, uh, revoked, social welfare uh, a subscription might also be uh, revoked and the risk of these uh, uh, bills becoming laws is huge because unfortunately we are used to such discriminatory laws uh, being actually uh, issued by the Israeli parliament. Therefore, I think it is very important uh, and I'm very grateful to Professor Link that is he is shedding light on the policies of uh, uh, Israeli collective punishment uh, in Palestine, and I am hopeful that the Human Rights Council uh, will take the appropriate measures to stop them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Munir. I now turn uh, to Professor Michael Link, UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Palestinian Territory Occupied Since 1967. 
He will present uh, his upcoming report to the 44th Human Rights Council and address Israel's closure of Gaza, a case of collective punishment against 2 million Palestinians. Thank you, Professor Link. There seems to be a problem with Professor Link's connection. I will turn then to Rania Muharib, uh, the time we get in contact with Professor Link. Uh, thank, um, I will introduce Rania, a legal researcher and advocacy officer at Al Haq. She will discuss the overarching framework within which the policy of collective punishment is used with the intention of domination of the Palestinian people and with the objective to impose and maintain Israel's apartheid regime over the Palestinian people as a whole. Please go ahead, Lana. Thank you, Nada, and thank you to all the speakers and everyone watching. Um, I think we've just heard a few number of um, forms of collective punishment imposed over the Palestinian people. Um, it's important to remember that the Palestinian people have suffered a long history of collective punishment, and that these policies and practices are not carried out in a vacuum, Instead, they must be understood within this broader regime or overarching framework of settler colonialism and apartheid over the Palestinian people. Uh, I think it's worth re recalling as well to start with that collective punishment has historically been carried out on both sides of the Green Line and that it dates back to Israel's military administration over Palestinian citizens between 1948 and 1966. Those 19 years that followed the Nakba or the mass expulsion of Palestinian refugees were marked with a climate of fear and intimidation, which was rooted in institutionalized oppression over the Palestinian people. Closures and curfews were imposed on Palestinian villages and towns, exit and entry permits were required and vice were severely repressed. These policies are etched into the Palestinian collective memory and they have intended to instill fear in Palestinians in order to deny them the exercise of their inalienable inalienable rights, in particular the right to self-determination, but also the right of return to their homes, lands, and property, even while many today remain mere kilometers from their original homes. A date vividly remembered by Palestinians is October 29, 1956, when Israeli border police killed 49 Palestinians in the Kufr Qasim massacre. Most of them were farmers returning from their work in the fields. Little did they know that a curfew had been imposed on their village earlier that day. These repressive policies and practices have permeated Israel's regime over the Palestinian people since 1948, and widespread collective punishment has become a staple of Israeli oppression and subjugation ever since. Collective punishment is manifested through an array of discriminatory policies and practices, as we've just heard, which include punitive house demolitions, revocation of residency rights, mass arbitrary detention, the withholding of Palestinians' bodies, closures of entire cities, villages, and areas in particular of the Gaza Strip for the past 13 years, as well as punitive denials of permits, such as work permits, but also permits for medical treatment or travel, um, in particular impacting Palestinian patients from Gaza. Israel's collective punishment is pervasive and systematic, and it can't be understood in isolation from the broader context in which it occurs. It's important to recall that the Rome Statute uh, of the International Criminal Court uh, enshrines the crime of apartheid as inhumane acts committed in the context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one racial group over any other racial group or groups and committed with the intention of maintaining that regime. Through collective punishment, Israel seeks to silence opposition. Thus, the practice serves as a tool to maintain racial oppression and domination. Collective punishment, as we've just heard, has a chilling effect on the lives of Palestinians and their families and communities, and is designed to create this climate of fear, repression, and intimidation, which is supposed to prevent Palestinians from exercising their rights. At times, we know that the Israeli occupying forces use different forms of collective punishment against the same families with a cumulative effect, which may amount to torture and other ill treatment, including psychological warfare. It's worth noting here as well that the Trump plan, which was released in January 2020, explicitly endorses collective punishment against Palestinians, despite the illegality of this practice. For example, it states that the demolition of any structure that poses a safety risk, as well as punitive demolitions, can and will continue in the occupied West Bank. 
As such, collective punishment is used to weaken the capacity of Palestinians to effectively challenge Israel's apartheid regime, and it must be addressed within that framework for which there is growing recognition. It's worth recalling here that in December 2019, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, CERD, found that Israel is in violation of Article 3 of the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which, in which states particularly condemn racial segregation and apartheid, and undertake to prevent, prohibit, and eradicate all policies of this nature in territories under their jurisdiction. For, uh, for the first time, CERD recognized that Israeli policies and practices of racial segregation and apartheid apply disproportionately against the Palestinian people, and not only in the occupied Palestinian territory, but on both sides of the Green Line. It's also worth recalling that on the 16th of June last month, 114 civil society organizations from around the world sent a strong message at the UN Human Rights Council um, to member states saying that now is the time to recognize and to confront Israel's establishment and maintenance of an apartheid regime over the Palestinian people. Delivering the statement of the Human Rights Council, they called on all member states to recognize that Israel has created this apartheid regime over all Palestinians, to endorse these concluding observations by UN CERD, and also to recommend the reconstitution of mechanisms such as the UN Special Committee Against Apartheid and the UN Center Against Apartheid to put an end to the system of oppression. Also on the 16th of June, 47 UN special procedures, including Professor Link's mandate, stated that the morning after annexation would be the crystallization of an already unjust reality, two peoples living in the same space, ruled by the same state, but with profoundly unequal rights. This is a vision of a 21st century apartheid, end of quotation. In 1973, apartheid was enshrined as a crime against humanity in the Apartheid Convention, which considered that an element of this crime is the persecution of organizations and persons by depriving them of fundamental rights and freedoms because they oppose apartheid. Efforts to silence opposition through intimidation and harassment, which include mass arbitrary detention, torture, sanctioned by Israeli courts, widespread collective punishment, and government-led smear campaigns, which target human rights defenders and organizations, are key measures implemented to maintain Israeli racial oppression and domination over Palestinians. In 2017, the UN Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, ESQA, it published a seminal report which found that Israel's strategic fragmentation of the Palestinian people into separate legal, political, and geographic domains constitutes the main tool of Israeli apartheid over the, the Palestinian people as a whole, comprising Palestinians on both sides of the Green Line and Palestinian refugees and exiles who are denied their right of return. Overall, through collective punishment and other measures of subjugation and control, Israel continues to entrench the strategic fragmentation of the Palestinian people in an effort to prevent them from collectively challenging Israeli apartheid as one people facing the same overarching system of oppression, with the ultimate goal, of course, of denying Palestinians the exercise of their inalienable rights to self-determination and to return. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shania, for giving us this overview on the overarching framework. I now turn to Professor Link, but just before turning to Professor Link, I would like to say that you can use the Q&A box in order to send us questions and questions to the panelists. Thank you. Professor Link, the floor is yours. Nada, thank you very much for this. And uh, let me first express my grateful thanks to the Cairo Institute for Human Rights, the organizers of today's webinar, for inviting me to speak alongside these distinguished human rights advocates, uh, Nada, uh, Sahar, Badar, Munir, and uh, Rania. I greatly admire your work, your advocacy, and your courage, and it's an honor to be speaking with you today. I will be delivering my fourth report to the UN Human Rights Council later on this week. The theme of my report will be on collective punishment, and I want to acknowledge that the idea for the theme came primarily from uh, Munir Nusabe from Al-Quds University, one of today's presenters. A year ago, he urged me to take on this topic in one of my future reports, and then he went the extra mile by organizing an excellent conference on the issue at Al-Quds University in October of last year. If today's audience would indulge me for one minute before I turn to the issue of collective punishment, I wanna first address an issue that's on everybody's lips these days, the looming annexation of Israel, by, of annexation by Israel of more of the West Bank. I address this issue of annexation as a special topic in my October 2018 report to the UN General Assembly, and I've mentioned it as well at the beginning of my current report. A month ago, um, 
as, uh, as Rania mentioned, I joined with 66 other human rights experts in a common statement denouncing Israel's plans for annexation. The statement was widely quoted in news reports around the world. Briefly stated, the statement made four points. First, annexation is a fundamental violation of international law, starting with the Charter of the United Nations and including the eight times when the UN Security Council stated that the acquisition of territory by force or by war is inadmissible. Second, what would be left of the West Bank following annexation would be a Palestinian Bantustan, islands of disconnected land, completely surrounded by Israel and with no territorial connection to the outside world. Uh, Israel has recently promised that it plans to maintain permanent security control between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. And as Rani has mentioned, this would result in the crystallization of an already unjust reality of two peoples living in the same space, ruled by the same state, but with profoundly unequal rights. Third, the, the already massive pattern of human rights violations associated with the occupation, including our theme today, would only likely intensify and get worse in the aftermath of the annexation. And fourth, the international community has continually criticized Israel when it annexed East Jerusalem and the Syrian Golan Heights beginning 40 years ago. But it has taken no meaningful action to oppose Israel's uh, actions. This time must be different. Accountability and an end to impunity must become the immediate and top ranking priority for the international community. So one of the areas of massive human rights violations that I just referred to, which I fear will only intensify in the aftermath of annexation, is collective punishment, today's theme. Collective punishment is an inflamed scar that runs across the entire 53-year-old Israeli occupation of, of Palestine. Over these years, two million Palestinians in Gaza have endured a comprehensive air, and sea, and land blockade since 2007. Uh, several thousand Palestinian homes have been punitively demolished. Extended curfews have paralyzed entire towns and regions. Mass arrests have, have occurred. The bodies of dead Palestinians have been withheld from their families. And critical civilian supplies, including food, water, and utilities, have been denied at various times. Notwithstanding numerous reports, resolutions, and reminders of its use, uh, Israel continues to rely upon a collective punishment as a prominent instrument in its coercive toolbox of population control. A fundamental tenet of any legal system, domestic or international, which respects the rule of law, is the principle that the innocent cannot be punished for the crimes of others. A corollary of this tenet is that the collective punishment of communities or groups of uh, persons for offenses committed by individuals is absolutely prohibited under modern law. Throughout history and in contemporary times, belligerent armies, colonial authorities, and occupying powers have commonly employed a spectrum of collective punishment methods against civilian populations hostile to their alien rule. These the methods used have included civilian executions, sustained curfews and closures of towns, food confiscation and starvation, punitive property damage, the capture of hostages, economic closures on civilian populations, the cutting off of power and water supplies, withholding of medical supplies, collective fines and mass detentions. These punishments are, in the words of the International Committee of the Red Cross, and I'm quoting, in defiance of the most elementary principles of humanity. And that's why the world has prohibited collective punishment through Article 33 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, allowing for no exceptions to the prohibition. Let me now address the issue of Gaza as a form of collective punishment. In June 2007, Israel initiated this comprehensive air, sea, and land closure of, of Gaza, which it maintains to the present day. The impact of Israel's 13-year-old closure has been to turn Gaza from a low-income society with modest but growing export ties to the regional and international economy to an impoverished ghetto with a decimated economy and a collapsing social service system. In 2012, the United Nations wondered whether Gaza, given its trajectory, would still be livable by 2020. In a follow-up report in 2017, 
the UN found that life in Gaza was deteriorating even faster than anticipated. In 2020, the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process observed that the immense suffering of the population in Gaza has continued. An important additional purpose behind Israel's closure of Gaza has been to accelerate the separation of Gaza from the West Bank, just as Israel actively works to separate the West Bank from East Jerusalem. Creating and entrenching the fragmentation of these territories beyond sinking the chances for creating a viable Palestinian economy, as well as blocking Palestinians from building the larger collective and political bonds with each other that nourishes a functioning society. All of this is designed to prevent the independence of the state of Palestine. As Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu stated in 2019, in response to criticisms about his decision to allow Qatari funds to aid the construction and utility projects in Gaza, and I'm quoting, whoever is against the Palestinian state should be for transferring the funds to Gaza because maintaining a separation between the PA in the West Bank and Hamas in Gaza helps prevent the establishment of a Palestinian state, unquote. In my report, I conclude that the actions of Israel towards the protected population in Gaza amounts to collective punishment under international law. The two million Palestinians living in Gaza are not responsible for the deeds of Hamas or other militant groups, yet they have endured a, sub a substantial share of the punishment that's been meted out uh, to them. Israel appears content to allow for the delivery of international of uh, aid going to um, Gaza, the, the basic humanitarian requirements that it needs, but then the turn the spigot off any additional modest assistance or economic activity depending on the circumstances. I remind Israel in my report that it is required under the Fourth Geneva Convention to ensure, and I'm quoting, to the full extent, the fullest extent possible of the means available to it, of the food and medical supplies are provided to the population. Economically, Gaza continues to steadily de-develop. De de its GDP per capita has declined by 30% between 2012 and 2019-2020. Its unemployment rate has gone from 31% in 2012 to 46% this past year, among the very highest rates in the world. Virtually the, virtually the only economic pulse that Gaza still has is the result of external aid and remittance transfers, which made up close to 100% of its economy in 2014, and which has been declining in volume since 2017. Gaza's social sector, sector is the second prominent area to be adversely affected by Israel's closure policy. Gaza's population has increased by 25% since 2000 to up to 2 million people today, but its living standards have sharply declined. Gaza in 2020 does not provide the living conditions that meet international standards of human rights, including the right to development. The numbers of Gazans living under the poverty line as of 2017 stands at 53%, which is up from 39% in 2011. And the World Bank in a recent uh, report predicts that this is going to rise up to 64%. Food insecurity has increased from 44% of the population in 2012 to 62% in 2018. Gaza has no reliable supply of electri electrical power. And 96% of the coastal aquifer, which is its main natural supply of drinking water, is not fit for consumption. And Gaza's healthcare system is, is severely depleted, has been brought close to collapse by the closure and by the cycle of escalating attacks on the Strip. In my report, I conclude that collective punishment is a tool of control and domination that is antithetical to the modern rule of law. Collective punishment defies the funda foundational legal principles that only the guilty shall incur penalties for their actions after having been found responsible through a fair process. Prohibitions against the practice of collective punishment are found in virtually all legal systems across the globe. The deeds of a few cannot, under any circumstances, justify the punishment of the innocent, even in a combat zone, even under occupation, 
even during times of popular discontent and security challenges. Like torture, there are no permissible exceptions to the use of collective punishment in law. And like torture, the use of collective punishment flaunts law and morality, dignity and justice, and it stains all of those who practice it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Link, for your intervention. Uh, I will conclude very shortly uh, with a short conclusion, and then we will go to the questions. And we have um, 25 minutes for questions, so please feel free to send your questions also through Facebook. For years, Palestinian organizations have documented the devastating impact of Israeli collective punishment on the Palestinian people and their basic rights. The ICRC, UN Security, Secretary General, High Commissioner Madame Bachelet, treaty buddies have all called on Israel to put an end to its illegal collective punishment policies. In the UPR review of Israel in 2018, several member states called on Israel to put an end to collective punishment, including Germany, but also Namibia and Malaysia. Despite the international community's opposition to Israel's collective punishment, the response has rarely risen above the level of verbal condemnation. It is time to take action to put an end to the inhumane policies of collective punishment described by my colleagues in this webinar. Our organizations call on states and UN agencies to deliver statements under item seven, condemning collective punishment and calling on Israel to put an end to these inhumane policies. I will start with a question to uh, all panelists. Maybe we can start with Munir. Um, Everyone reiterated that in order to put an end to collective punishment, member states are also required to address the root causes of Israel's oppression, which include Israel's settler colonialism, prolonged occupation, and the apartheid regime imposed over the Palestinian people as a whole. What action can third states take in order to fulfill their responsibility to end collective punishment in light of its prohibition, including under Article 33 of the Fourth Geneva Convention? And um, we will then go through um, uh, speakers, panelists, and uh, include more questions from uh, the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Nada, and uh, many thanks also to Professor Link uh, and all the panelists. Um, answering your question, um, following actually on what you said, it is not enough uh, from any state to simply condemn and uh, uh, you know, verbally uh, criticize uh, these actions. It is uh, certainly uh, decades after consistent human rights violations, an apartheid regime that is uh, ruling uh, over uh, Palestine. It is very clear that uh, uh, unless there is some practical intervention, uh, we are not going to see any change. And I would say uh, specifically on the uh, topic of collective punishment, a lot of the measures of collective punishment uh, that uh, we discussed today uh, are criminal uh, in international criminal law and criminal according to the Rome Statute. Um, for example, if collective punishment uh, uh, also produces uh, forcible displacement to civilians uh, in an occupied uh, territory, uh, it's not only a collective punishment which is in itself a violation, but it is also um, uh, a the crime of forcible displacement, which is uh, clearly defined uh, in the Rome Statute. Um, and I uh, find it uh, very uh, unfortunate and, um, um, uh, and sad that uh, there are many states until today who uh, are against the intervention of the International Criminal Court uh, in Palestine. Um, I don't see how they uh, think that uh, this intervention will not uh, be, be, be helpful to advance peace. If there is no deterrence to crimes that are going on on a daily basis, um, uh, we're not going to, um, uh, to see any difference. So in that case, I would urge the uh, prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to look into this uh, as well, to look into collective punishment and the measures that are used uh, uh, as collective punishment. There is also another, you know, there is also persecution uh, um, when we look at all of these uh, crimes happening at the same time. It also amounts to the crime of persecution. And as my uh, colleague Rania uh, mentioned, it also falls under the crime of apartheid. 
So all of we have several crimes that are being committed simultaneously, and I believe that the ICC uh, should take measures. And I'm glad that the um, you know that the ICC is taking it seriously, and I hope that these efforts will be successful. And I leave to my other colleagues to comment on other measures that might be taken. Thank you very much, Munir. I now I add to the question uh, by the public, since collective punishment is illegal, what kind of effective measures can be taken by third states and duty bearers? So far, third states and duty bearers have been largely unsuccessful in putting pressure on Israel to stop these practices. Maybe Rania uh, Muharib can also uh, answer this question. Absolutely. Um, and I will definitely add to what Munir was saying about, first of all, these constitute international crimes and they give rise to individual criminal responsibility. Therefore, the ICC has jurisdiction of, over these crimes and should um, immediately open a full, thorough and comprehensive investigation. This has been a demand for many years by Palestinian civil society organizations. Um, the focus on accountability is important for us because for us, we know that there's impunity, there's widespread impunity for Israeli human rights violations. And these violations will not be brought to an end without serious justice and accountability at the international level. In addition to the International Criminal Court, which Munir has already addressed, um, there's also universal jurisdiction, which is an obligation of all high contracting parties of the Geneva Conventions, an obligation to ensure respect for international humanitarian law in the occupied Palestinian territory, and in this regard, to exercise criminal jurisdiction over suspected perpetrators and to try them in their own courts, in their own jurisdictions. This is an obligation. It is not just a measure that we are suggesting. It's an obligation on all high contracting parties. Um, another very important measure that for us is important to highlight is the issue of coercive measures, because throughout the past 70 years, there have not been any coercive measures to bring an end to Israeli impunity. It's, I think, enough to, to highlight that there have been 10 UN commissions of inquiry and fact-finding missions on Palestine since the year 2000, over the past 20 years. Not one recommendation by any of these commissions has ever been implemented. And the reason for that is because there are no effective measures to actually ensure Israeli compliance. And when we talk about effective measures, what we mean is sanctions, economic sanctions, um, and other measures to ensure that these violations are brought to an end. And the final point that I already mentioned in my intervention is that for us, it's important to recognize those root causes and to understand that collective punishment doesn't happen in isolation. It happens within this broader regime of oppression and domination over Palestinians. And therefore, to put that to an end, we need recognition by member states, which already exists. We have South Africa and Namibia at the Human Rights Council, who already recognize the existence of an apartheid regime over the Palestinian people. But more further, member states are called upon to do the same and in that regard also to recommend reconstituting mechanisms within the UN that can put an end to that injustice, which are the UN Special Committee Against Apartheid and the UN Center Against Apartheid. Thank you very much, Rania. I now turn to Professor Link with two questions that came in. Are there any measures that can be taken against third states for not responding with sanctioning or other actions in response to the obvious violations of international law, etc., by Israel? And another question, which is, what can be learned from the case of Crimea? Both, uh, both very good questions. Um, the, um, if people are interested, and uh, I will refer this to you now, in my October 2019 report <clears throat> to the UN General Assembly, which can be found on the, the UN website that's been created for my particular mandate, my entire report was devoted to the issue of accountability and countermeasures. And towards the end of that report, after making out the case as to why we need to uh, seriously consider countermeasures and sanctions with respect to Israel's behavior, um, I take you through um, the number of different types of countermeasures and sanctions that have been commonly used over the last 30 to 40 years by the international community in a range of areas where there has been a, a significant breach of international law. Keep this in mind, is that there are three primary obligations um, anchored in international law that compel states to cooperate with each other to do two things. One is not to aid or abet in the ongoing commission of an illegal uh, crime or a um, or a breach of international law, 
but the second is also to come together to aid and assist each other is a positive duty to bring an end to the uh, to the illegality and we find these in common article number one of the four, four geneva conventions articles 40 and 41 of the 2001 articles on state responsibility and finally and simply on uh, article 25 of the charter of the united nations which compels every state to obey the directions of the uh, internet of the united nations security council so what are some of the common types of countermeasures that have been used in recent decades um, by either the united nations or by a large assortment of international countries coming together uh, as a coalition these kind of countermeasures that are commonly used in the international world would include public statements against the particular situation or state diplomatic sanctions trade sanctions the reduction or, or suspension of aid and cooperation financial um, and economic sanctions banning of air flights arms embargoes and travel restrictions uh, these countermeasures have been used over the last 30 to 40 years uh, to promote democracy and human rights to advance the rule of law to oppose annexation and aggression to combat terrorism to address threats with respect to international peace and security, to rectify serious humanitarian situations, and to protect vulnerable minorities and end conflicts and, uh, and civil wars. And this leads me obviously to the second question that's been asked with respect to Crimea. Um, I do not see any particular daylight between the situation of the 2014 Russian annexation of Crimea and the, and the already accomplished uh, annexation of East Jerusalem and the Syrian Golan Heights and the anticipated annexation of at least parts of the West Bank uh, that have been promised in the current um, coalition agreement but, um, in Israel. Um, the European community and the international community acted with great swiftness in the aftermath of the annexation in March 2014 of Crimea. Uh, and it did it without um, receiving the direction or sanction or blessing coming from the United Nations, because obviously Russia was a veto holding member of the uh, Security Council. Nevertheless, they mobilized and they brought in economic sanctions against uh, Russia. It suspended agreements uh, or downgraded uh, economic agreements that it had with Russia. It booted Russia out of the G8 and it, it froze its application to join the OECD. It brought in specific individual sanctions against a number of people who had been directly involved in the um, um, in the annexation of uh, of uh, Crimea, and it did this at some considerable cost to the European economy. I look at Israel and I think, well, on the one hand, Israel is dependent for having somewhere between a third and forty percent of its external trade with the European Union. And on the other hand. Europe uh, imports from Israel perhaps one to two percent of its total uh, of its total um, Im imports from, from around the world. The European Union has a great deal of economic and political sway with respect to uh, uh, Israel, and it could easily bring in a range of escalating or targeted sanctions that would be would finally be mean paying a cost uh, on Israel for sustaining the, the illegal occupation. I just read a fin an interesting book by Nathan, Nathan Thrall from the International Crisis Group. The book is called The Only Language They Understand, which is about the uh, Israel and Palestine. And he says that uh, the world has been wrong in assuming Israel will is acting irrationally. In, in many ways, Israel is acting entirely rationally. It can continue with its settlement projects. It can continue with the imposition of collective punishment, um, knowing that the world will not impose any detailed economic cost on Israel. And as long as Israel's punishment, if you like, is limited to um, diplomatic demarches, to occasional to resolutions at the uh, General Assembly, um, and to occasionally an angry foreign minister, uh, it will recognize that's a very small price to pay for the very large benefit it has for maintaining and deepening the occupation. So sanctions and countermeasures and overall the issue of accountability has to be at the top 
of the international community's response to the ongoing occupation. Thank you, Professor Link, for these um, responses to these qu important questions. I will now turn to Budur Hassan uh, for her concluding observations um, and any answer to questions regarding what can third states do and um, what are actions that our, the Palestinian organizations are asking member states to take. Okay, so I should, uh, referring to universal jurisdiction, which Rania mentioned, I probably should take this time to remind everyone that in 2010, when a group of Spanish and Spanish Argentinian activists went to the Argentinian court after all channels were closed in Spain in order to pro put pressure on Spain to facilitate the exhumation of uh, bodies of uh, those who have been assassinated during and after the Spanish Civil War, something that dates back to the 30s of the last century. It was the Argentinian court that employing universal jurisdiction sent letters and put pressure on Spain and on Spanish local council and local authorities in order to carry out exhumations. And if it weren't for the intervention of the courts in Argentina on that occasion, many of these bodies would not have been exhumed. In many occasions, when we speak about withholding of bodies in Palestine, some of these cases might amount to enforced disappearance, which is which is a crime against the humanity. Like a prisoner, Anis Dorley, who was uh, who was killed or who died in prison in the 1980s, and whose body was quote unquote lost, even though he was in Israeli prison. Several cases of withholding of bodies where the families were not notified about the deaths of their loved ones and did not see the bodies and did not see any hint did not even get access to know the details of the killings of their loved ones or the alleged killings of their loved ones might amount to enforced disappearances. This is why the employing universal jurisdiction is vital in addition to opening thorough investigation by the ICC. Unfortunately, not only are third state abdicating their responsibilities in employing universal jurisdiction, in many cases we see states hurrying to change their legal regimes in order to explicitly absolve Israel and Israeli war criminals of responsibility. This needs to stop. We can't uh, uh, keep saying that annexation is a crime and warning against annexation, while on the other hand, uh, blessing Israel directly and indirectly through continuing collab cooperation, economic co cooperation with, with Israel, and through shielding Israeli war criminals from responsibility. It is a moment of truth, and many Palestinians have been saying this for a long time. We can't just keep saying that the, the solution, that there is no longer solution. There is actually a solution, and a solution which both Rania and uh, Professor Link has referred to is the imposition of effective countermeasures on Israel, uh, again, both through ending impunity. This seminar, this webinar is titled The Price of Impunity, and this is, has precisely being the price of impunity is that Israel has been able to pursue its measures, including collective punishment, including the continuing of settler colonialism and apartheid, because it has enjoyed impunity and because absolutely it has been working absolutely rationally. Because when Israel feels that there is zero cost that it is forced to pay for its settlement uh, projects, for all that it has been doing, then it would continue. And finally, I would encourage all those who claim to oppose annexation, especially third states, to look beyond the current frameworks and to view all of Israel's action as part and parcel of one project, which is, happens on both sides of the green line, as Rania reiterated, and which is also targeting Palestinian refugees. Unless we uh, change the framework and begin to see the a whole, the totality of the Israeli settler colonial project, Israel's crimes will not uh, end. Thank you very much, Budur, for uh, these answers. I would now turn to uh, Advocate Sahar Francis and ask a question uh, if you would like to address it or if you want to um, conclude. Uh, the US, as Israel's greater enabler, seems to enjoy the same impunity as Israel for its financial support of Israel. 
what, if anything, can with the international community be willing to do against this? And of course, the larger question of accountability, which was asked by several of uh, the questions we received. Thank you. And uh, I think, yeah, I totally agree with what Professor Link was uh, saying about accountability and the ability of the states, actually, if they have the political will to do and, and uh, put pressure to end the Israeli occupation, they know how to do it. So what is missing here is the political will by the states and third state parties to implement their obligations under international law. The international law have lots of uh, uh, solutions for all these grave violations that we were talking and discussing today and much beyond what we discussed today. The occupation itself is becoming a crime uh, uh, according to the Israeli practices and uh, under the international law. So it's needed to put an end for the Israeli occupation as a whole and to put an end the accountability and to implement the rules of the international law. So I think we need the people to put more pressure on the states and I think we should start looking into legal ways how to find these states accountable for, own, for their own obligations in their own legal systems inside Europe, especially in, in order to push them to implement the international law and their ob obligations actually according to international law. In the US as well, I think it's a bit more difficult to, to think about legal strategies in the US uh, system, but I think the power is with the people in the United States, especially now with what's going on against racism from the different, the grassroots on the uh, Black Lives Matter and other uh, uh, groups that they are initiating activities against the uh, policies of racism and discrimination. I think they have to associate with the call for divestment and sanction that the Palestinian society uh, sent out uh, and asked the activists to be joining. So as more as we can join the call for PDS for boycott, divestment and sanctions, I think we can pressure states to be more active on the uh, ending the Israeli occupation. Thank you very much, Sahar. I am just uh, receiving a question um, from Facebook that is being sent here. Um, uh, a question to Professor Michael Ling. What changes and real lasting differences the UN human rights mechanisms, including special rapporteurs produced by, uh, reports produced by experts, brought impact in forcing Israel, Israel in changing its apartheid practices? Uh, if I understand the question correctly, they're asking what impact the work of the UN Human Rights Council in general and special procedures in particular have brought. Um, it's, I must say, it, it's, it's hard to gauge with respect to that. Um, um, I do know that Israel, despite its non-cooperation with the Human Rights Council and particularly with the, its, its minimal cooperation with special procedures and virtually and, and absolutely no cooperation with my mandate or of my two media predecessors, nevertheless, I think pays attention to the comments um, made in, in our reports, made in our statements. Um, certainly the statement that, um, uh, that Rania made, uh, quoting the statement that came out this time last month from 67 um, human rights experts that commented on the issue of annexation, was widely quoted throughout the world. It was, uh, it was commonly cited in a number of, uh, by, by news outlets, by NGOs, and it was in the letter that, uh, among other people, Senator Bernie Sanders sent to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo with respect to the opposition of 12 uh, Congress people um, against annexation. So there is an influence that's there. Uh, the work of special rapporteurs is taken in, uh, into consideration by the world, less so in, in Israel, but because 
the world pays attention to what special rapporteurs say in general. And I like to think what it says, it pays attention in, in particular to what either I say by myself or what I say in conjunction with colleagues. It's a factor they have to recognize is part of the international conversation, the international debate and, and the discourse all around this. So um, that's why I encourage uh, people to wind up continuing to support the work of the, uh, of the Human Rights Council. It's an invaluable forum for those who are vulnerable, for those without a voice, for those who are, are seeking to have the human rights realized to be able to, uh, to find a, a ready forum, a special rapporteur who will take up their cause in this. Remember that we special rapporteurs are not paid by the UN, we're not paid by anybody um, for the work that we wind up doing. We are independent of the United Nations, even though that we're attached as an important component of that. And because of that autonomy, because of that independence, we can say things that many UN officials cannot say. Um, I'm often in, in conversation with my UN colleagues, and it's not that they're telling me what to say, but I think we recognize we have different but complementary roles to play in the articulation and the advancement and the advocacy with respect to, uh, to human rights. So I welcome the question and I welcome the ability to be able to explain a little bit about the kind of work that we wind up doing. Thank you very much. I want to thank all panelists for their invaluable interventions and recommendations. And I would like to thank all Palestinian organizations that coordinated this event with um, CIHRS, Al Haq, Adala, Wikla, PCC, Adamir, Al Mizan, PCHR, CAC, Civic Coalition, JLAC, Frog, and Fengo. Thank you very much to everyone. And I would like also to thank all participants who followed our webinar. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks to all. Many thanks. Thank you to everybody. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.